me, it's Mark, it's the, you know, Kevin Systrom and Instagram, it's all of these people, um, understood this consciously, and we did it anyway. Take really big, audacious points of view on the world, and then train ourselves to be patient. And it's really, really hard. The entire society is set up to not be patient anymore. Consumer internet businesses are about exploiting psychology. And that is one where you want to fail fast because, you know, people are unpredictable. And so we want to psychologically figure out how to manipulate you as fast as possible and then give you back that dopamine hit. We did that at, brilliantly at Facebook. Instagram has done it. WhatsApp has done it. You know, Snapchat has done it. Twitter has done it. So there are great examples. WeChat is doing it. There are great examples of failing fast is the right path to exploiting psychology of mass populations of people. I feel tremendous guilt. Um, I think, we, I think we all knew in the back of our minds, even though we feigned this whole line of like, there probably aren't any really bad unintended consequences. I think in the back, deep, deep recesses of our minds, we, we kind of knew something bad could happen. But I think the way we defined it was not like this. Turn it off. That's what I would say. It's, it's, it's hard for young people now because they're hooked. They're addicted. If you don't think you're addicted, and I'm talking about anyone, from the highest to the lowest, if you don't think you're addicted, then see if you can turn it off for a week. It got quiet in here, didn't it? <laughs> didn't it get real quiet? It's a tool. So we should use it. God has blessed us with free will. Now it's free will magnified, free will on steroids. You're free to go in any direction you want. It will allow you, and it's not the enemy. It's just a, it's, it's just a reflection of our own free will. You know? and, and we all want to be liked. But now we want to be liked by 16 million. And will now some of us do anything to be liked? We, we used to do anything to be liked, but it was the, by the person in front of you. Now it's to be like by 16 million people that you don't know. We have to ask ourselves, what is the long term, if not too, the short term effect of too much information? So the context was I was, I was at Stanford and the dean asked me to speak to the, the MBA students. And in it, what I was talking about was the question was, you know, what do you think the uh, long-term effects of social media in general are? And unfortunately what happened was, I think it's easy to characterize what I said just as a Facebook, Facebook specific thing because I worked there and I was a key part of growing it. The, the, the reality of what well, I was... Explain what you said at the time. So about what I said Facebook. was, I think the tools that have been created today are starting to erode the social fabric of how society works. And what I meant by that is the following thing. Today we live in a world now where it is easy to confuse truth and popularity. And you can use money to amplify whatever you believe and get people to believe that what is popular is now truthful and what is not popular may not be truthful. You know, Joe and I, for example, we've been on the wrong other side of climate for a long time, right? right? And the reality is now I can take money and I can use that through all of these social media systems that exist to hundreds of millions of people and I can convince all of Joe's friends and everybody like him of my opinion in very subtle and small ways and he can do the same to me we can do that about vaccines we can do that about gay rights we can do that about bathroom laws we can do that about Roy Moore and so I think the question we have to ask ourselves is how do we live in a world where this is now possible and so it was about that but just so I understand it was it because because I read and watched parts of what you were talking about part of it seemed to me about the ability to pay to manipulate people's thoughts. The other seemed to me to be this sort of ADD society with which the sort of liking well, and so everything else has created this sort of feedback loop that you, that you compared to drugs. We know for a fact that what all of these systems do, every single one, is it exploits our own natural tendencies in human beings to get and want feedback. And that feedback chemically speaking, is the release of dopamine in your brain. And so what these feedback loops do, and they exist everywhere, in Call of Duty, in other video games, in social networking sites, they get you to react. When Facebook was getting going, I had these people who would come up to me um, and they would say, you know, I'm not on social media. 
and I would say, okay, <laughs> you know, you will be. And then they would say, they would say, no, 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 no. I value my real life interactions. I value the moment. I value presence, and I value intimacy. And I would say, well, you're a conscientious objector. That's okay. You don't have to participate, but you know, we'll get you eventually. <clears throat> and 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 like. I don't know if I really understood the consequences of what I was saying. <laughs> because it, the, un, the unintended consequences of, 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 a, of a network when it grows to a billion or two billion people and it, and it, begin, and it, it literally changes your relationship with society, with each other, with you know, it, 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 it probably interferes with productivity in weird ways. It, God only knows what it's doing to, to our children's brains. You know, if the, if the thought process that went into building these applications, Facebook being the first of them to really understand it, that thought process was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible. And that means that we need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while um, because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever. And that's going to get you to contribute more content. And that's going to get you, you know, more likes and comments. And it's a, it's a, val it's a social validation feedback loop that, that it's like a, I mean, it's exactly the kind of thing that a, that a hacker like myself would come up with because you're exploiting a vulnerability in, in human psychology. It literally is a point now where I think we have created tools that are ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. That is truly where we are. And I would encourage all of you as the future leaders of the world to really internalize how important this is. If you feed the beast, that beast will destroy you. If you push back on it, we have a chance to control it and rein it in. And it is a point in time where people need to hard break from some of these tools and the things that you rely on. The short-term dopamine-driven feedback loops that we have created are destroying how society works. This is a global problem. So we are in a really bad state of affairs right now, in my opinion. It is it is eroding the core foundations of how people behave by and between each other. Um, and I don't have a good solution. You know, my solution is I just don't use these tools anymore. I haven't for years. It's created huge tension with my friends, huge tensions in my social circles. Um, if you look at like, you know, my Facebook feed, I probably haven't, I've posted maybe two times in seven years, three times, five times, it's like just, it's less than 10. Um, and it's weird, I guess I kind of just innately didn't want to get programmed. And so I just turned, tuned it out. But I didn't confront it. And now to see what's happening, it's really, it really, it really bums me out. Like think about, like there were these examples where um, there was a hoax in WhatsApp where um, in some like village in India, um, people were like afraid that their kids were going to get kidnapped, etc. And then there were these lynchings that happened as a result, where people were like vigilante running around, they think they found the person, and they, I mean, I mean, seriously? Like, that's what we're dealing with. You know, Im imagine like when you take that to the extreme, where, you know, bad actors can now manipulate large swaths of people to do anything you want. It's just a, it's a really, really bad state of affairs. And we compound the problem, right? We curate our lives around this perceived sense of perfection because we get rewarded in these short-term signals, hearts, likes, thumbs up, and we conflate that with value and we conflate it with truth. And instead what it really is is fake, brittle popularity that's short-term and that leaves you even more, and admit it, vacant and empty before you did it because then it forces you into this vicious cycle where you're like what's the next thing I need to do now because I need it back think about that compounded by two billion people and then think about how people react then to the perceptions of others it's just a it's a really bad
So you're training your brain here, whether you think it or not, whether you know it or not, whether you acknowledge it or not, acknowledge that these things where you're spending hours a day are rewiring your psychology and physiology in a way that now you have to use to go and figure out how to be productive in the commercial world. So if you don't change this, you are going to get the same behaviors over here. Change this. There's a reason why Steve Jobs was like anti-social media. I am telling you I'm not on these fucking apps. I'm not him by any stretch of the imagination. But I am proactively trying to rewire my brain chemistry to not be short-term focused. I'm telling you they're linked. And I think that if you get too desensitized and you need it over and over and over again, then you become actually detached from the world in which you live. You become callous, you become crude. And you live in front of your screen. But, but Shamath, let me ask you this, because the, the thing that I've been so concerned about is Facebook just announcing that you're going to be having some app that you can use when you're 7 to 13. I mean, it's one thing for us to be doing this, but to be hooking your kids on something that you're describing as a dopamine fix at so, that age, that's crazy. So look, I think in the case of Facebook specifically, I think they have probably done more than any other company, quite honestly, to try to fix it because of all of the companies, and I've seen them all up close, they're the most, frankly, to be very blunt and honest, the best run and the most technically sophisticated. But they're, and, also, they're also emailing me if I haven't logged onto Facebook for a while saying, hey, did you see the post from so-and-so? Did you see the post from so-and-so? Trying to lure you back in. And again, we can make those decisions as adults, yeah. but as, as children, that is a different... Well, I think the product, and I don't know it quite honestly in as much detail as I should, but I think the way that that product works, because of privacy laws in the United States, you actually have to get parental permission. The point, though, is, and what you're bringing up, is, I think, is the most important thing. We all have never taken a step back and actually asked ourselves, how should we be interacting with these things now, seven years into it? And what should we be expecting of the internet at large? Look, the reality may be the entire business model of the internet may be fundamentally somewhat broken, right? Because we allow ourselves to get interacted with in ways where we don't necessarily control the medium or the messenger. And we are not putting up any barriers to ever give yourself any downtime from that either. Exactly. And so it may mean that we all collectively need to figure out, not just individuals, but also the companies, right. also governments, quite honestly, how different business models need to exist so that we can actually divorce ourselves from how so this what, stuff what is working. So what goes on? Tonight here, a warning about Facebook and what some believe it's doing to kids. The warning comes from two of the company's earliest executives. Carter Evans is following this. We kind of knew something bad could happen. Chumath Palihapitiya, a former Facebook executive once in charge of user growth, now says he has tremendous guilt about the social network he helped build. We have created tools that are ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. And it's influencing the next generation. Studies show 92% of teens go online daily, and one in five young people regularly wake up in the night to send or check messages on social media. People need to hard break from some of these tools and the things that you rely on. The short-term dopamine-driven feedback loops that we have created are destroying how society works. No civil discourse, no cooperation, misinformation, mistruth. Bad actors can now manipulate large swaths of people to do anything you want. He's not the only social media executive blowing the whistle. Former Facebook president Sean Parker recently said the initial goal was to get people hooked. You're exploiting a vulnerability in, in human psychology. The inventors, creators understood this consciously and we did it anyway. We have to hold the tech industry accountable. Jim Steyer is founder of Common Sense Media. They in many cases have ignored the consequences, some of the downsides of some of the innovations they brought to our society. You don't realize it, but you are being programmed. It was unintentional, but now you gotta decide how much you're willing to give up. When Facebook was getting going, I had these people who would come up to me um, and they would say, you know, I'm not on social media. And I would say, okay, you know, you will be. 